guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Before we get to the video, I want to give a short shout out and a dedication to my newest, youngest, smallest super fan, Oliver Robot. I got a great email from your father this week, and I got to say that it touched my heart and inspired me to do this. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it, and these parts are continuously getting smaller and more tedious. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's watch. Next piece in line is number 15, and that is just about real size. This is a pretty tiny little piece right here. This is the index paw that will grab a hold of that little spur gear that I just made and push on it and index based on the rotation of this screw driving the table, sliding the table over. So this little guy right here, <laughs> it's right there. This little guy here is detail it down here in the corner. Now 188 is about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Uh, it's about four and a half millimeters ish. So the part is relatively small. And just for fun, I wrote a program on my CNC. I'm going to cut this out on the CNC real quick and then I'm going to do it on a rotary table and we're going to compare the times and the effort that it took to do so. So let's grab a piece of brass, stand it up in the V block, push the green button on the CNC and watch the chips fly for about a minute and a half. For anybody with a CNC machine, here's a little bit of logic the way I'm going to handle this part. This is actually an 075 diameter cutter, and this is fairly much to scale. If you were to take a cutter that would go maybe two or three times the depth of the diameter of the cutter, and just plow it through and run the perimeter of a part like this, you risk snapping this part off. So what I plan to do is I plan to take the perimeter code of this particular part, which is very small, and I'm going to turn it into a subroutine. Now, a subroutine is just like a stamp with your signature on it that you can just walk around stamping things and all of a sudden you have an entire signature there, as opposed to actually taking the time to write your signature. And if that makes any sense, instead of just rewriting a dozen lines of code, this is just one line of code that says repeat those 12 lines. That's basically what a subroutine is. So by doing that, I can put in incremental steps and instead of going full depth on this part with this cutter, I can go around this cutter as many times as I care to, bring the cutter off the part, reposition it to a start point, and then go down a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And before you know it, you've consumed the entire depth of the cutter. If you want to do this with your CNC machine, as you are taking your incremental depth cuts with the cutter that you're using, lie to your tool table and say that that cutter is five or ten thousandths of an inch bigger than it actually is. That way it'll stay away from the part as it goes around the perimeter. Now, why do you do that, you say? Well, because when you want to make a finish pass, take that incremental depth, dial it all the way down, go to your tool table and tell your tool table you have the correct size cutter in there, and you can rough and finish with the same tool. So you're going to see the cutter dancing around a little bit down here in this corner. The initial placement is going to be down here. It'll slide over. It'll start to cut this way around the perimeter and jump off, reposition, and start again. So, well, it's not going to be into the part like that, of course. I'm doing this freehand. So it will be tangent to the edge. It'll be comp left, and it'll be climb cutting the entire perimeter. 075 end mill, two flute. Let's do it. Give you a rough idea of the size of the cutter I'm going to use for this demonstration. There you go. It is an 075 diameter cutter that's just a little less than two millimeters, and as you can see, that's just about the same size as an unsharpened pencil tip.
You can just barely make out the Paul feature that's in the center of it. It is really tiny. It is off center because that's how I programmed it. It's 100 thou off center to consume the material. I'm going to tell the computer now that my tool is back on its regular size and I'm going to take a finish pass at full depth. It'll be very minimal burr, but or it'll be a very minimal chip, but it should be a nice finish. Let's do it. Okay, you can see the parts sitting nicely in the center there. And you can imagine how much work this is going to be when I do this on a rotary table. But I will do it as a demo to show you that it can be done. And it's, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but it's not going to be as easy as it just was. Now behind the scenes on a CNC, there's tool calibration, there's tool selection, there's models, there's tool paths. So on a one-off like this, Somebody might actually be able to get close to a CNC time. Eh, not real close, but it would be respectable for one piece. But when it comes to the second piece, third piece, 50th piece, you know, the poor guy on the manual is just going to run screaming from the house. So let's take a look at how this is going to come off of here. I'm going to put it back in the machine. I'm going to face it off. I'm going to part it off and deburr it. And we're going to have one finished piece before we get to the mill. Let's do it. The part is now comfortably back in the 5C collet, and you can see it nested in the material right there. This, uh, if I were to do this again, I think I would leave a more solid section of this little pawl directly over center, so it would be easier to part off. I have a sneaking suspicion that this is going to be a bear to get a hold of once it decides to fly, so let's see what happens. Maybe it will survive. And there she is. You can see where the center of the part was and how much easier it would be if I could move this particular part off feature up into the meat of the component, like up into here somewhere so it wouldn't have to be where it is. Now to get that off, I'm going to use a pair of these flush cut pliers. These are great for electronics if you go looking for them. This is not a sponsored item, but Crescent brand. Found these at, I believe it was Lowe's. I just pressed the part right up against it and give it a snip. Does a fairly good job of removing proud remnants. I will take and put this back across the 400 emery on the bandsaw table, nice and flat. Polish it up, see if I can deburr it. Give you a final look when it's done. But how's that for small? Okay, clean it up. 
after a couple of light passes on some 400 emery and back to the cardboard with the metal polish on it this is what I have I am very pleased with this this was a full CNC part and if you're building this kit and you're afraid of this part and you want one of these leave it in the comment line below I got enough feedback I might just put a few on the website because this is going to be a bear to do on a rotary table I may or may not approach this on the rotary table uh, you know I think I will just because it's a challenge and there's an awful lot of math involved so let's see what it takes that is really small Alright, we're going to move over to the rotary table and we're going to knock this piece out. I have all the confidence that it's going to go very quick, possibly quicker than the CNC effort took. Now this little piece here, you got a couple of dimensions on here, adequate to make that part. Uh, except for the 1 16th radius typical. That could mean here, here, and both of the inside corners. But actually you really can't do that right there because they would overlap and it may be an issue. So you have to go a little bit smaller on the inside. 50, 45. For the mill demonstration, these are going to be 37 and a half. I'm going to use an end mill that's 75, the same way I did on the CNC. Now let's take a look at what this needs to look like if we're going to do it manually. Ta -da! Manually, we're going to need a couple more numbers. Just because we don't have a computer to move the thing around. Initially, I'm going to set the machine, or I'm going to set the part, so that the part sits on the Y-axis this way. Center of the rotary table will be right here for now because I can get away with murder with this center of the rotary table right there. I'm going to drill the hole. I'm going to drill the hole on size and I will use that as the center of the universe. I can take a cut up the outside to bring that edge in. I can take a cut across the top to bring that edge in. And I can take the end mill that I used since the radiuses, the radii in these two corners are conveniently sized. I can plunge here. I can plunge here. I can walk them together and then I can spin the part in the rotary table all the way around to the tangent point here. So in one setup I will have the part complete from that tangent point there all the way around, all the way around and this will be a sharp corner here. This will be a continuous hook and square. So that's what we'll get on the first try on the second side or actually on the second op because it's going to have to you're going to have to move the table in order to pull this off i will rotate that part on the rotary table 45 degrees lock the table in at the 45 degree number coming back to that tangent point drop the cutter back in there and walk this surface off if i get real brave i can offset the entire part the entire setup in the machine this way and interpolate this radius we'll see I'm thinking this is going to go pretty quick, so let's get over to the machine, start with the drilled hole in the center, and away we go. The entire setup right now is by eye. It's round material, the cutter is located on center, but uh, towards the operator's side of center on the y-axis. Real time, 133. See how long this takes. Camera is currently located on the left side of the machine to the rear of the table, so I am looking from behind the machine, standing on the left-hand side of the machine. Here we go. I'm gonna drill all the holes first so that when I punch the end mill, the end mill does not have a tendency to wanna to walk off center. Only the very first hole will be on size. Everything else will be a pilot feature for the end mill. Those two holes are too close together to do that, so I'm just going to go with the one and nibble away when I walk the end mill.
Everything that can be done has been done from this particular setup. You can see we've got the pivot hole, the OD, and a lot of this is reflection. <laughs> At least I hope it's reflection because, boy, if it's not, that looks terrible. The 45 hook is in there, and now the radius on the back has to be done, but it's from a different pivot center, so the entire setup needs to be moved at this time. Let's take a closer look at the setup as it sits. Going to go handheld here, so get your Dramamine out, people. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that's the seasickness medication. I've got a parallel rail on the back, an adjustable parallel against my little mini vise. And a stop on the opposite end as well. So any precision movements I need to do to shift the center of this rotary table I can do with pins, blocks, shims, whatever, on both of those two faces. So let me grab the appropriate blocks, sneak them in there. We'll come back and we'll put a radius on that back corner right there. This particular block right here, this block and this block are the standards for the center of the rotary table on the first setup. Without unloosening this clamp right here, so this vise was nice and tight, I unloosened this clamp slid a shim in and then re-secure the clamp against the shim. Now this is the amount that the table or the part needs to move in this direction. Same thing in the back. I put a pin in between my adjustable parallel and the stationary rail. Now a lot of you are going to say, hey, it's adjustable. What do you need a pin for? Well, you're absolutely right. If I would have pulled that out and measured it, readjusted it and stuck it back in, I wouldn't need the pin, but the pin is a lot quicker. So that particular pin is going to stay there because that's the shift of the entire setup this way. And for this guy right here, I'm going to now remove that shim and close up the gap with the vise. There we go. So it's a very minimal shift on the x-axis and a considerable shift towards the operator on the y-axis. I should now be on center to put a radius on that corner right there. <laughs> Theoretically, let's find out. That vertical corner right there is the corner we're looking to round off if everything went well. And that should happen.
Pop it out on the bench. Take a look. About midway through this part, maxed out the memory on the camera. So I did spend a little extra time deleting some photos. Real time 217. I would say all in all, not bad for a part that looks like that. Done manually. <laughs> I gotta go find myself a camera that I can focus on the unfocusable. All right, let's put it in the lathe, part off, see what happens. This is the one done manually. And just so nobody calls fakey foul, this is the one done on the CNC. And I'm going to lay them side by side and we'll see if we can tell which one is which. I would say in the overall comparison, the CNC has definitely got a cleaner this is the CNC part right here. That's the one done manually. The one done manually has a little bit smaller radiuses on the inside of the hook. And I'll tell you, I think that's a win. Showing how they can be done two different ways on the different machinery. That is not an easy part. And as we sit here right now, it is 23 minutes to 3 o'clock. So the real-time calculation, you can do that. Or I'll just put a note on the screen here. Because I'm not going to do it in my head right now. But they sure are tiny. I'm glad there's only one. And I uh, figured I would show you that second setup just to show you that it can be done manually. And it's not really that difficult. This was a rather easy part. Setup-wise. There's nothing critical about locating a corner of a part or a face of a part and a little selfish self-promotion. If you ever have to do that, take the scary out of rotary table work. If you ever have to relocate a part, locate a vice on your rotary table, I go to my toolbox right here and I use my rotary table alignment tool, which has multiple faces for referencing the center line of the spindle. You just clamp it in your vice and locate it and indicate it whatever you got to do and boy you are right on the money that thing will make your life easy if you don't have one stop by the web store check it out that's all i got for now guys it is almost 100 degrees it is friday afternoon and i am ready to get so thank you for stopping by i hope you are well and safe wherever you are in the world this is joe pie at advanced innovations in austin texas i'm out <laughs>